Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to South Adelaide today. We welcome all our visitors. We have with us this morning Sue and Ken Crawford, Rob Scott, Harriet Walker, and Jason and Mel Gore. And thank you, Jason, for your service to us today. Uh, not too many things uh, on the announcements list this week. The prayer people to keep in mind are Richard and Ruth. And we have Bible class this Wednesday at 8pm, now in chapter 10 of Luke. The arrangements for next Sunday, the 10th of June, God willing, are to chair and exhort Richard, uh, music, Greg, and flowers, bread and wine, Julia. And today's collection is general ecclesial funds. Thanks. We'll continue our worship this morning with the singing of hymn number 138 and if you can remain standing we'll follow with prayer. Thank you. Heavenly Father, 
We thank you that we can gather here this morning in peace and freedom to remember you and your son, to be reminded of your greatness, your purpose to fill this earth with your glory. Although you are the great creator and the sustainer of all things, we see and know you are mindful of each one of us. We come to meet here because you are a living God and because your son is risen and lives in each of us, making us your sons and daughters. We come to meet here desiring to be lifted up that your living spirit will abide in each of us and bring forth that same fruit of humbleness, meekness and sincerity of servitude beautifully shown in the life of your son. The word, your word made flesh, full of grace, your grace and your truth as he walked this earth. Father, we pray for your forgiveness as we recognise the daily battle within, that to heed your call and follow you is not always easy, as we have lives full with activities that build our standing in this world, the pursuit of wealth and comfort. Pleasures that are temporal, that tear at our spiritual mind daily, crowding out the spiritual activities that are wholesome and eternal often failing to show that dedication, sincerity and the humbleness, the fruits that are eternal. But we thank you, Heavenly Father, that we do have a high priest, your son Jesus, who makes intercession for us and we thank you and rejoice that you do forgive each of us. We believe, Father, that you have saved us and we trust, even rejoice in that power to save for it is a great power far beyond anything we can imagine with our mortal minds. The work you have begun and will finish in each one of us is truly wonderful and we thank you for it. To that end, Father, we pray for the return of your son from your right hand to take his rightful place as a king on this earth, to rule this world in justice and equality to establish peace in the earth forever, when sorrow and death, as we know it, will be no more. And Father, be with those of our number that are absent this morning, whether for travel or sickness or spiritually struggling. Hold them in the palm of your hand. You know their needs and bless each one of them with your care and return them to us, that together we can with them rejoice in the love of true fellowship that we share here together. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for our prayer people this week, for Richard and Ruth. We thank you that you are with them and motivate them, that they walk amongst our midst, that they are examples of strength continually for us, of that way which is right and that we should follow. We ask you to continue to be with them and keep them in good health. And be with us this morning, Heavenly Father, especially with Jason who will deliver words of exhortation. We pray that you will work through him, Father, to lift and bind us together in faith, hope and love. For we ask these things through your beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. By way of introduction, Jason has asked if we can read from John chapter 1, verse 1 to 18, and we'll ask Rob to come forward and read that for us. Thank you, Rob. Reading John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. 
And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Thank you, Rob. And thank you, Jason, for coming with your family this morning to be with us to offer us words of exhortation. Thanks, uh, Brother Mickey, and thank you for your prayer this morning. And uh, good morning, dear brothers and sisters. It's uh, lovely to be here with you and to see uh, so many familiar faces and to uh, fellowship with you this morning. So really, uh, really happy to be here with you all. Um, it's great to, to come this morning and to share some, uh, some thoughts with you on our Lord, full of grace and truth. And uh, it's a pretty large subject, but um, th we'll probably really only scratch the surface, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, there's so much we can discuss about that. But as human beings, we, we love to witness uh, extraordinary talent and skill, don't we? And for some, it might be witnessing the, the skill of a performing musician uh, that's given their life to honing their fine motor skills uh, required to um, give a flawless concert and, and all the discipline and practice that, that goes along with that. For others, it might be witnessing the amazing uh, athletic ability, um, you know, in a team sport or, or in a solo discipline, um, you know, perhaps the kind of skill that only many can dream of and, and the Winter Olympics comes to mind uh, for me, I couldn't get enough of it uh, this year, to be honest. Uh, any snowboarding event was, that was on, I, I, if I could see it, I, I would. Uh, incredible what some of those athletes uh, can do. You know, maybe it's uh, an artist that, uh, you know, just so magnificently captures the light or the landscape or, or a, a portrait of a person. And the emotion in their painting and, and the skill leaves uh, one boggled. But there's many uh, humans in this century uh, and centuries that have gone before that possess and have possessed uh, just such amazing talents. Um, and often, though, it's a testimony to man's glory. And yet all of these combined, they, they really pale into insignificance when compared with the glory that was witnessed 2,000 years ago by the generation um, at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. We read that this morning, didn't we, in, in John, chapter to one, John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, 
he has declared him. Now, the world had never seen such a manifestation of God's glory as was now displayed in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And in the words of Paul, God was shining into the hearts of mankind the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You know, this morning in our our exhortation, we want to uh, focus our minds around those qualities, those amazing qualities of of grace and truth. You know, sometimes in our busy lives, and and Brother Mickey mentioned this uh, in his prayer, we we can often just be caught up with with things going on and, and sometimes we just need to step back and appreciate the big picture of who God is, his plan and purpose, what he desires of us, and then see it and apply it in our everyday context. You know, there is a saying that says we are the average of the five most people that we spend our time with. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting thought, isn't it? We are the average of the uh, five people we spend most time with. You know, one of the wonderful things perhaps for us to think about is, well, you know, if we, if we spend that time with Jesus, if we spend that time uh, understanding him and, and, and learning from him, well, well that certainly uh, brings all our averages up, doesn't it, uh, with, with that. But uh, we can't help be uh, impressed uh, by John's record as he speaks about the grace and truth seen in Jesus full of grace and truth. You know, it's like John is mesmerised. He, uh, he's in awe of what he saw. Um, listen to how he explains his first encounter with Jesus uh, in his epistle. So this is first of John, chapter 1. He says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands, concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, And we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. You know, as we opened uh, this morning with the idea of of mankind loving to witness amazing ability, well, those that beheld the Lord Jesus were experiencing something far more extraordinary, the Lord Jesus full of grace and truth. You know, the record says full, doesn't it? And, and you get this idea of uh, it's like a cup that's just full to the brim with water. You, c- you can't get any more grace and truth into, into Christ if you tried. He, he's just completely full, completely full. You know, what are, what are some of our thoughts and, and that around uh, grace and truth? How do we define grace? How do we define truth? You know, perhaps at times we can feel like uh, maybe grace and truth appear to be at odds. Um, You know, maybe we could see sometimes that grace and truth perhaps seem to be uh, mutually exclusive. You know, that if we were to to show uh, grace, uh, perhaps we are somehow diluting truth or or vice versa. If we are showing truth, we we perhaps um, have at the expense of neglecting grace. You know, maybe there's some conflicting feelings or, or thoughts around these ideas. But John says he was full of grace and truth. And perhaps at times um, we have the notion that we, we need a bit of grace and, and we need a bit of truth. Um, and somehow we, we just need to even the scales and, and get them in balance. Kind of like a 50-50 um, approach. Well, the Lord Jesus wasn't half full of truth and, and then half full of grace, as though it was a makeup of 50% uh, of each, bringing it to 100%. But the Lord Jesus was, was, uh, was full, 100% full of grace and 100% full of truth. And I guess the maths kind of doesn't stack up if you're trying to think 100 and 100, it's what's going on here. But, but that's the reality, I think, as we, we'll come to see uh, this morning that Jesus was full, 100% full of grace and truth. So when John declares that in Jesus he saw the glory of God, what did he mean? What did grace and truth look like? How did that translate into the human experience of hearing, seeing and touching just 
as John described. Well, let's begin firstly by looking at truth. What does it actually mean that Jesus was full of truth? What did it mean for Jesus? What does it mean for us to be full of truth? You know, we can often use that term, can't we, whether uh, consciously or or unconsciously, uh, to describe our doctrine, uh, the definition of our faith. And we might perhaps say that, you know, we're going to teach someone the truth, or we are in the truth, or we have the truth, uh, inferring that we have perhaps a correct theological understanding of the Bible. Now, this certainly comes into part of the truth as, as described by Jesus and how the word can be used, but if we left it as simply a creed of doctrines and theological understanding, I think we, we really miss much of the meaning behind this word. Now, as with, with many sort of Greek words, we often sort of come back there a little bit, don't we, just to help us understand a little more about this, but the meanings can often vary uh, slightly within the context um, that they're, they're used. Um, I'm certainly not, not Greek, so forgive me if uh, I pronounce this wrong, but the Greek word for truth is aletheia, um, and uh, it uh, has a number of, of meanings, again, depending on this context. And so it can mean uh, what is true in any matter under consideration. So, you know, we might say, uh, is it true that the sun is shining uh, this morning? To which we can all give an answer to those facts. And it's a beautiful morning out there. And we would say, yes, the sun is shining. That is true. Uh, Truth, uh, this word truth uh, can also mean truth as a personal excellence. So a sincerity of mind and and integrity of character. So for example, I I promised myself I would get up and go to the gym, uh, and so I kept my commitments uh, to myself uh, and of course to others when when I say I'm going to do something. You know, there's a truth to what I'm saying. It also uh, can mean, and, and in many of the contexts in the New Testament, it has this meaning, what is true in things appertaining to God and the duties of man. So this is a moral truth, a truth about a right understanding of God and by association having the right attitude uh, and behaviour. And so maybe just to sort of flesh this out uh, a little bit more, you know, Jesus says, doesn't he, in John chapter 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way and the truth. So he's saying, I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So I guess in this uh, context, is Jesus saying that he's a set of theological facts? Or or does he mean that he's actually a moral example of what is true in relation to God? Well, the next verse uh, in John uh, actually explains that. Jesus says, if ye had known me, you would have known my father also, and from now on you do know him and have seen him. So Jesus was a moral example of of the father uh, and behaved like God and had God's attitude. You know, Jesus also says in in John 3, he says, uh, whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. And so there's definitely also this uh, alignment of, of truth and light. You know, we, we may sort of ask still, well, well, what is truth? You know, it's interesting that there was actually someone else that uh, asked that question. It was uh, a little bit more in a sarcastic uh, context, but, but Pontius Pilate, he said exactly the same thing uh, to Jesus, didn't he? John chapter 18, verse 37, Um, the record says that Pilate said uh, to Jesus, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, "Ah, what is truth? And after he had said this, um, he went back outside uh, to the Jews. But for Pontius Pilate, uh, this idea of the moral truth of which Jesus spoke about, 
it, it was really relative. It had no meaning. Um, and as the history books reveal, uh, Pontius Pilate was, was a corrupt and, and a vindictive individual. Um, he had little integrity and, and uh, would often go off in, in fits of rage. But for Pilate, a moral truth was really non-existent. He would act and, and behave as he pleased uh, and as suited his own purpose. And so without the truth that the Lord Jesus bore witness to, you know, we really perhaps find ourselves completely vulnerable uh, to the deception of man's heart. Where, where truth is really relative to our passions and desires and, and self-preservation. We perhaps find ourselves in, in darkness, again, as that uh, truth aligns with, with, um, with light. So uh, I guess you could look at uh, you know, the, the deception of man's heart as, as sort of finding ourselves in darkness. But it's very much the lesson that Paul paints uh, to the Ephesians, uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, uh, in verse 17, he says, This I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness." So Paul is describing the truth as seen in the Lord Jesus as the exalting of God in his life over his own will, uh, such that you know, the, the works of the flesh, they're not given any airtime at all, but rather his life was instead a complete manifestation of God. Je Jesus was faithful to God. And so the truth, as Jesus showed, is really uh, an attitude of mind and a way of life that is faithful and obedient to God. It's, it leaves behind all pursuits of, of self-glorification, and it's really the humbling of oneself to do the will of God. You know, perhaps to condense that even further, really the truth, as shown in, uh, in Jesus, is about faithfulness to God. To, to being faithful to God. Yeah, it's interesting, just as a side note, in, in Exodus 34, we have the glory of God described in his character as, as merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. And, that, and that's the King James uh, version, but many other versions actually translate that word in, in Hebrew for uh, truth as faithfulness, um, describing um, God's character um, where we read truth in the King James as, as faithfulness. You know, and we have a number of examples around uh, the Lord's faithfulness uh, to God uh, just in his life. And maybe just to, to uh, quickly have a look at some of those. You know, the Lord Jesus in, in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he prays uh, to the Father, and he speaks about having delivered the words of God and that he had been faithful to make God's word known. You know, he humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. He did not grasp at equality with God. He didn't exalt his own will. Um, he wasn't lifted up in pride against God, but he was obedient uh, unto death, and, and the, the faithfulness of, of the Lord Jesus, the, the truth um, that he, he showed, was, uh, was emanating uh, in his example. We had Brother Mickey mentioned in his prayer this morning as well about our Lord Jesus being a faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. He, he's a faithful high priest uh, in things pertaining to God. And there's so many more examples where the Lord Jesus uh, just emanated uh, faithfulness to God in, in upholding uh, all that God was and all the beautiful characteristics uh, of God. 
you know, no wonder John was mesmerized uh, when, when he saw that uh, from the Lord Jesus. You know, it's such a contrast to, you know, what we see in the world and, and through, the, through the ages where, where mankind perhaps, you know, disregards the moral truth of God. And, you know, Romans 1 kind of uh, uh, brings this, this out where it says that we can exchange the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. And that's often what happens, isn't it? When we're not faithful to God, we can find ourselves uh, lifted up in pride where you know, we, we want to serve our own interests uh, and we can, we can end up worshipping the creature more than the creator. You know, and we see that, don't we, when, when human pride and, and self-will uh, end up being exalted above God, uh, the, the works of the flesh just so easily rear uh, their, their ugly head uh, and God's character and glory can be, can be overshadowed. But, you know, Jesus, he, he, he emanated that 100%, you know, faithfulness to God and, and was a wonderful thing. You know, and I'm sure as, uh, you know, I, I talk about this, I'm, I'm very keenly aware of, of my own uh, failings and, and times where, where faithfulness uh, to God um, has been overshadowed by my own self-interest uh, and will. But we've been given grace. We've been given grace that through faith we can be justified and, and made righteous and have that, that moral truth and faithfulness attributed to us through our identification uh, with Jesus. And, and we remember him uh, this morning uh, and, and what he has done for us. Uh, with, with the grace that has been given to us. You know, it's probably a good opportunity now for us to segue a little bit uh, into, into considering the Lord Jesus full of grace. You know, and for me personally, I sort of feel that, um, you know, the grace revealed by God and the Lord Jesus is actually made more special and, and perhaps more potent uh, against the backdrop um, of God's moral truth which I, for me, I, I sort of uh, feel that if I didn't fully appreciate the, the, the truth of God and, and all that God really is, you know, maybe I would lose the impact uh, that grace can have um, without truly appreciating the truth of God. You know, um, as humans, we, we can often like to set our own moral standards, can't we, where it's often a little bit more achievable to, to what uh, we can accomplish. And, and uh, you know, we, we can sort of say, well, if we, you know, dress a certain way or attend X number of events or, or contribute so much volunteer hours or, or this and that, we, we, we've probably got a pretty good standard there. But when we actually think about... Uh, the moral standard, it should always be God, shouldn't it? It should always be God and the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. And I think when we keep this realisation of God's uh, standard of moral truth, we, we realise that we're going to be always in his debt, that we can actually never repay, we, we can never of our own merit um, completely uh, exhibit the truth uh, of God. And yet that's when the beauty of God's grace shines through, when we can truly appreciate that wonderful grace that has been uh, given to us um, through Christ, our Saviour. You know, the Greek word for grace is, is charis, um, and essentially it means goodwill or kindness. You know, it... Uh, it essentially mean, means a kindness that we've, we've had, um, you know, attributed to, to us and that we see in Jesus. It's, it's a kindness that has been, uh, has and can be given. And whilst the word, um, you know, simply means that, often the context, again, can help sort of give a little bit more meaning uh, to the word. Uh, in many cases, uh, the divine grace that's given uh, and spoken about in... in uh, the word of God is often uh, around an undeserved kindness um, that has been has been given to us, and you know maybe just as a bit bit of a more of an everyday example um, to help us perhaps appreciate this, 
You know, we could paint a scenario where, where maybe someone in the meeting has, uh, has had a vehicle accident. Um, you know, they've ended up with multiple fractures. Uh, they're hardly mobile and, and they're perhaps struggling with, with the household chores and getting to the point of not coping uh, at all. And, you know, we might naturally feel some compassion to want to help out and assist um, with that, um, you know, person going through those things. Now, if I add a little bit more information to the story, we, we might sort of um, uh, look at this person that's had this unfortunate uh, accident, and but they're, they're also the same person that when we were sick and needed some assistance, um, you know, had been sort of telling people that maybe we were putting on a little bit of an act, uh, a bit of an attention seeker maybe, um, and perhaps a little bit disingenuous uh, toward us. And so the question is, is all of a sudden would that feeling of compassion dry up? Would we feel that this person was uh, undeserving of our kindness? You know, we're, we're really now faced with a choice, aren't we, where uh, do we still offer kindness, despite our feeling that they might uh, have been a little bit disingenuous and a bit undeserving? Because that's when that idea of, of showing grace, that divine grace, the character of God shown in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, comes in. You know, and, and that, that is, uh, grace is a divine characteristic uh, of God. And, and Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. And so Jesus cites the example of God as the reason for grace to be shown, that God is kind even to the evil and the unjust. You know, another familiar passage uh, that shows this is, is Romans. It says, God shows his love for us in that while, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, and I think what we sort of get out of this is a real realisation that God has a great desire to see people saved and he will go to great lengths to give people the opportunity to turn to him um, and, and it's exactly the same with the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, full of grace. He had a great desire to see people uh, saved. You know, one of the interesting things is sort of going, what, what did the Lord Jesus Christ himself actually say about grace uh, in his ministry? Um, and it's, it's quite interesting. I, I found this quite interesting that the word for, for grace, charis, is only used four times by the Lord in the Gospels. And three of those times are actually in Luke uh, chapter 6. Um, Luke chapter 6, verse 32 to 36. And this is, this is what Jesus says. He says, if, if you love those who love you, what benefit or what grace, what grace is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit or what grace is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to them, to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit or what grace is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good to, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Now, I guess the question is, does grace have a purpose? And I think in some of these passages, it's, it's very clear that the purpose of this grace and kindness being shown, even when uh, it's seemingly undeserved, um, is that uh, there, is, there is definitely a purpose uh, to this. And Paul says in Timothy, he says in 2 Timothy 1, verse 8 and 9, he says, Do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, 
but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. And uh, Titus is another wonderful passage that, that comes out uh, giving this idea of the purpose of grace. Titus chapter 2, verse 11, Paul says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, to live sensibly, righteously and godly uh, in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. And so grace has a really purposeful intent uh, to provide opportunity for repentance and to choose a new path. It's an opportunity for the recipients to become better people and grace is a powerful force for change. You know, it's interesting, the Apostle Paul was so moved by the grace that was extended to him from God that, that every letter that the Apostle Paul wrote begins with the expression, grace to you, um, or, or the grace of our Lord Jesus, uh, and he also ends with that expression. And I think the only exception is the book of Hebrews, which it has been said maybe because uh, he was trying to convince uh, the Jewish uh, population about uh, Christ's uh, place uh, taking over uh, and going before the law. But it's, it's one of those amazing things, isn't it, that, uh, that grace can give the recipient the opportunity to be a better person, an opportunity to, to change and to, to seek to become uh, more like God. And I think maybe as we, we start to wrap up this uh, exhortation uh, this morning um, is that we can remember our Lord Jesus being 100% full of grace and truth. You know, he was 100% faithful to God in all things, but also so wonderfully emanated 100% of that kindness of God, uh, looking for the salvation of, of others. And, and even when... Uh, you know, he himself maybe felt hard and, and, and perhaps people undeserving. We might uh, think of, you know, uh, when he was being taken to the cross and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, you know, in that instance was, was an amazing gesture of kindness and goodwill, um, seeking for the redemption of others. But... Uh, We've seen that um, you know, truth really distills down to that idea of being faithful to God, to exalting God's will uh, above our own in, in all things, uh, in thought and in deed. And we've seen that the quality of grace, that kindness of God, when shown to others, although maybe undeserved, it's an opportunity for the recipient to become a better person and to choose God's path. And I think hopefully we can all just be inspired a little bit uh, this week as we, we go about our, our everyday lives to try to let those qualities just sink in and, and, and be a part of our lives, um, knowing that that's exactly what we saw in our Lord Jesus Christ. So thank you. Thank you, Jason, for those wonderful words. It is probably often, isn't it, that we do think about truth more as a mechanical thing, and perhaps that has a little to do with uh, our upbringing for some of us. But thank you for pointing out to us, Jason, that that idea of truth is about a moral set of behaviours that we display in understanding the grace of our Heavenly Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, full of that grace. So thank you, Jason, and we ask you to take back with you the love and the greetings from, to your ecclesia from the brethren and sisters here at South. 
Let us continue now with the singing of uh, hymn number 258. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 19, it is recorded that he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it. And it ga he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let us give thanks for the bread. Dear Jesus, we pray to you at this time as we are about to take this symbol, this bread, symbolising your body, that according to the will of your Father, you gave your body for us in true servitude. Indeed, you are the Word made flesh, full of your Father's grace and truth. As we partake of it, we thank you that through your death we are a part of your one body, your spirit, your Father's spirit that lives in each one of us and works in us to produce good works after your example. Lord, help us to reflect on these things as we partake of this bread now. We ask this in your name. Amen. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
And Jesus went on to say, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Now let us give thanks for the wine. Lord God, our Father, we thank you that you first loved us. As we take this fruit of the vine that represents the cleansing blood of your Son, help us to reflect on the life that it gives, the price that has been paid, that we are your family, standing before you, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, the perfect sacrifice that has obtained the victory, that through your good grace is also ours. We rejoice, Father, that we have a place in your kingdom along with your Son, our King. And it is in his name that we offer this thanks, our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. Amen. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. We'd like to thank everybody that has participated this morning, particularly Jason and Greg for playing. And uh, as a closing hymn, we will sing PTL number 134, and that'll be followed by Brother Richard uh, offering a closing prayer. Hymn number 134, or PTL. Thank you, Greg.
us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Loving Father, we thy children desire to come before thee at this the conclusion of another memorial meeting that we've been blessed with. We thank thee for the words of exhortation, that we take them to heart. And Heavenly Father, we acknowledge thy goodness, thy greatness. Thou art the creator and the sustainer of all life on earth. Indeed, the whole universe is thine. And we thank thee, loving Father, for the grace and the truth that has been granted unto us. Even this day, to be able to separate ourselves from the world and to come unto this sanctuary and to appreciate the privilege that we do have. Heavenly Father, we do sincerely thank thee for it. And should thy son not return, loving Father, we pray that we might have been inspired today to go out in the week before us and to be good servants, to be good examples unto other people. And just like a moth is attracted to a light, may others be attracted to thy word of truth. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this privilege that we have of breaking bread and we acknowledge the, the obedience that has been exhibited in thy Son, the Lord Jesus the Christ, in that he was faithful unto thee even unto death. And loving Father, please instill that in us that we might do the same. And Heavenly Father, if thy Son should not return, may it be a blessing of thine that we could once again come together as children of thine unto this place to consider the things that lay before us. Be with us then, and as we go our separate ways, may we have thy blessing as we do go in thy good grace and thy truth as we do sincerely pray through thy Son, who is to be earth's future King, the Lord Jesus the Christ. Amen.